how is technology affecting geopolitics today in a huge way? Uh, I think most people have not yet fully understood the implications. To me, this is a little bit like, you know, when the world changed at the end of World War II, when, you know, up to that point, people were fighting each other with classical weapons, and all of a sudden, uh, the um, discovery uh, of nuclear power for military purposes, but also for civilian purposes, became a reality, and the world changed in so many ways. Um, I think we are now, with cyber, uh, with the digital revolution, uh, in the next age. We're beginning to move into the next age, and this is why technology is influencing politics and uh, military activities and uh, deterrence and uh, war fighting and peacemaking uh, in a huge way. In that context, what do you think is the biggest cybersecurity issue that you can think of? Well, I think there are, there are a number of uh, key issues. I'm not the expert for the technical aspects, but from my vantage point, from the political strategic point of view, the question of uh, the quest for norm setting, the quest for establishment of rules of the game is key. It seems to me that at the beginning of this new age, we are in a kind of a Wild West situation where everything is possible because there is no proper policeman out there and the rules haven't been fully established. And that, that's why some people, the bad guys, uh, can take advantage of uh, new technologies in ways that we don't want uh, to be used. So norm setting, for me, is one of the big, big issues. Some experts have said that the world is in a state of a cyber arms race. And you just referred to it. Are we at a point where we need cyber arms control? And if so, what could be some tangible steps toward cyber arms control? Well, some people have, of course, said that establishing rules and uh, establishing uh, arms control efforts is, uh, is, a, is a hopeless case, etc. I don't think so. You know, let me give you the example from when mankind became capable of exploring outer space. That was also a kind of a Wild West situation. No one had written uh, laws about what can you do in outer space, what can you not do. It turns out that after years of debate and negotiations, uh, uh, a universally accepted convention was agreed, and as far as I can tell, people adhere to this convention that does not allow the stationing, for example, of weapons, including nuclear weapons, in outer space. space. So that's actually an encouraging example, and I think that we should work very hard to try to... Um, to, 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 get, to get us all in the direction of arms control. What does this mean? It means that uh, you need to be able to verify what everybody does. And that's one of the hardest points from the technology point, but also from the political point. Unless you can't verify what others do, you can't punish them for, 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 for not observing the rules. And you can't actually make sure that you, if you adhere to the rules, you're not, not going to be punished because you are going to be at a disadvantage. So there are huge obstacles, but I think we should not let ourselves be deterred by these obstacles. We need uh, cyber arms control. Yes, we do. In addition to your experience as a, 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 an expert for arms control, really, you also have a lot of political experience. You were the deputy foreign minister in Germany. You were the ambassador to the United States, to the United Kingdom. It seems to me one of the challenges is to get this arms control discussion underway, is to really get countries to start moving in that direction and start creating some kind of agreement between, between countries. Do you have an idea of, of how that process could be reinvigorated and how, how, how countries can start to find some common ground in, in this space? Well, one simple rule is don't wait for the last guy to say yes. You need somebody who goes forward and uh, takes some uh, kind of leadership role. I would have expected in the good old days that uh, the United States 
would be, you know, the lead country, uh, or, uh, you know, the European Union, maybe together, the West, mm -hmm. uh, the developed world, the, the, the world of technology. Um, I still hope that there is going to be enough energy left uh, among Western countries, uh, Europeans, and Americans together to uh, provide that kind of leadership. But without proper leadership, uh, if we wait for, you know, for the Chinese, for the Indians, for the rest of the world, for the Russians to come along, we'll wait forever. And I think you're hitting on one of the key points with that. The, there is a certain proposals on the table, I think, from the Western like-minded countries in this space. Other countries have made proposals. And one of the questions that seems to be at the center of the debate is whether this arms control framework or this norm setting framework uh, should that be merely voluntary? Uh, should it just be politically binding? Or should it be something with more teeth? Should it be legally binding? Do you have a, have a view on that? Well, you know, I think that before we decide about uh, voluntary or binding, whether it's a formal treaty or just a, an international agreement uh, in legal terms, the important question for many of us in, in Western countries is, uh, can we make sure that whatever we agree is not going to create for states uh, some kind of censorship uh, for the freedom of speech, for example? Uh, how can we balance the rights of the individual uh, in this global world where many countries, many governments, have uh, no greater intention than to limit access of their citizens to certain types of information? So. Uh, to make sure that we get this right, it's probably a pretty good idea to start with something that's more voluntary than binding. The binding agreement would be my ultimate hope, but I think that's going to be very, very hard and a really long way to go. And are there some lessons, you think, from some of the other domains of conflict, be it in the nuclear space or some of the biological chemical weapons conventions that also took some time to negotiate and that didn't just happen overnight. Are there some key takeaways you think governments, but also the broader multi-stakeholder community should look at and embrace and try to uh, infuse in this, in this cyber discussion? I would have two pieces of advice. The first one is time and timing is an underrated instrument of international diplomacy. If something doesn't work out right now because you don't have the necessary international consensus at this very moment in time, maybe six months later the situation will have improved. If it doesn't work in six months, maybe next year. In other words, the first advice is don't give up if it, happen, if it doesn't happen right now. The second advice would be, uh, in the past, on many issues of international concerns, it was good enough for governments, negotiators acting on behalf of governments, to work out the agreement. I think this time in the 21st century, on cyber and cyber-related issues, it's very important that we get a very unusual kind of alliance together, namely governments and companies. Without the technology companies, without those who know how the technology is built and what, w and what the next steps in this technology will be, uh, we will always be behind the curve. So this, is a, this requires a new a cooperative arrangement between governments and uh, the business community. One of the ways that you have actually been evolving the Munich Security Conference is that you have uh, brought in some of the non-traditional voices, really other voices in addition to government leaders, uh, bringing in civil society, bringing in voices from the private sector to discuss some of the both traditional but also emerging security issues. Uh, how, how in your mind um, is this important in trying to address some of those emerging issues and, and uh, perhaps you can tell us what, what you think the key issues are? You know, there's a huge change that's been going on for the last decade already in uh, uh, shaping the debate about international security. 10, 15 years ago, it was possible to have this debate 
about uh, American security, European security, global security um, among po political leaders, diplomats, generals, um, etc. Limited to you know those who represented the nation state effectively. Today, you cannot have this discussion in an intelligent manner if you don't have uh, the business community involved because normally the parliamentarian or the general doesn't have the um, in-depth understanding of the technological changes that we are experiencing. Uh, and this go goes, of course, far beyond uh, military issues. It, 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 it affects the labor market. It affects how people communicate each other. Think of fake news. Think of manipulating um, political systems. Think of the U.S. electoral process and all the questions that have been coming up. So the international security debate today and tomorrow needs to be a much more broadly based discussion with generals and parliamentarians and political leaders, but including the CEOs and the technology in, uh, offices from large companies and civil society, the NGOs that represent, you know, human rights issues or freedom of the press issues um, or actually climate and energy issues. Uh, security has become a much more, a much broader concept than in the past. And that's why our audience is growing broader each year. Maybe one of the final questions I have for you is, as you are looking toward the next iteration of the Munich Security Conference next February, what are some of the key issues that you think will be discussed at the, at the forum? And how is that evolving when you look at your tenure as the chairman of the Munich Security Conference? How, how have these issues evolved over the last uh, several years? This is actually a, an enormous challenge each year. We spend a lot of time uh, trying to figure out what's coming up over the horizon even before we see it. That's a hard question to answer. And we have not always, I admit, we have not all, always been fully successful. So there are obviously short-term issues which we have to discuss. How to deal with Russia? How to deal with China? How to end the war in Syria? What about the conflict in Ukraine? Uh, etc. Those are the obvious things that you read about in the newspaper every day. And then there are the longer terms, over the horizon issues. Artificial intelligence. What about the, um, uh, the word, uh, the, the quote from Larry Summers, former Treasury Secretary, who, uh, who talks about the reduction in the labor force in Western societies because of artificial intelligence and related phenomena. So uh, what does it mean in terms of political stability, uh, 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 prosperity uh, of our societies? And then the next question, demographic change in Africa. If it's true that over the next couple of decades, the population of Africa south of the Sahara will, uh, will grow from one to uh, almost three billion, where do you think these people will want to go if there is not enough growth in their home countries? In other words, what we have seen in Europe in terms of migration and refugee uh, crisis uh, will uh, be nothing compared to what may happen in the near future unless we, the global society, are not starting to do something about it. Creating growth in Africa. Uh, turns out to be a major challenge for international security, a question that nobody in the area of security would have thought of 10 years ago. Thank you very much, Ambassador Ishinger, for these very insightful answers.